best minds in the business of franchising globally and his area of specialization is franchise relationships which is one of the key factors of the franchise system and we i have uh, uh mr gar maria uh, chairman franchise india group and my other brother uh, who will be joining me for this uh, uh this broadcast this afternoon uh some of the house rules will be displayed uh, on the on the screen so we uh, we would be taking a lot of q and a in the end of the uh, end of the session and uh, we also would be encouraging a lot of interaction through chat uh, option which is which is available uh, uh, what what we want to achieve in next almost one hour is uh, you know uh, an opportunity to sort of understand the, from a global point of view how how franchising is operating in present times and we also want to look at uh you know uh understanding from greg and gorov as to how the relationships during these times have been affected uh before uh, without much uh uh ado i would request greg to sort of uh, make a quick introduction about yourself and uh you know uh, you also have a small presentation which you can you can start thank you sachin and i'll be sharing my slide so i need to have the slide share option please as a co-host which uh to be able to show my slides to everyone so if you could arrange for that please thank you you could try pre prakami may need to do that thank you you could you could try now uh still not there apologies to everyone on the call here we go there it is Tremendous. Thank you. So I love the way that you you published my picture, by the way, with a guitar plectrum background because I'm actually a guitar fanatic and I've got 40 guitars. And um, sometimes I weave the music into my presentations. But um, I've been running the Franchise Relationships Institute now for 32 years and we are passionate about the importance of healthy franchise relations between franchisors and franchisees. Gaurav, before I just um, start on the presentation, the formal presentation, is there anything that you wanted to say or, or set up to get us on the right direction? Sure, thank you, Greg. I think uh, uh, today we would like to be more on the listening side because we have the greatest minds in the room. You know, and uh, I always maintained, uh, Greg, over my 23 years of experience, and I'm a little straight on that, uh, you are the greatest minds in franchising I've seen because I, uh, uh, you have uh, been able to uh, articulate the most important part of uh, the franchise ecosystem, which is relationships. And the way you have defined what we all, I mean, all our human lives are all about relationships, but uh, just to define and, uh, you know, micro define rather, I would use it, uh, this relationship and how you build abilities in organizations, companies, their, their team members to understand the importance of relationship and how they can, uh, they can build that uh, within uh, franchise systems has been remarkable. And well, thank, thank you for that. Mm, I appreciate that. Now, look, my, I, have a, I do have a hope for, for this session and I'm talking to everybody who's listening in at the moment. I'd like to make this interactive and um, to have you engage. So I've got a question to put to everyone in a moment. And it's going to involve you opening up your chat box, the chat where you can type in. And my question is this, I'd like to know what is your physical energy at the moment? Now, if you are, are one, it means you want to go to bed, you're feeling horrible, your energy is low, you can't concentrate. If you're a 10, you are feeling fantastic at the moment, and you could be anywhere in between that and Sashi's jumped in, fantastic, Sanjay's jumped in with a 10. So I'd like everybody on the call to jump in and tell me what your energy number is, and I've got a reason for doing this too. So everyone's jumping in. Oh, Rajiv, I'm so sorry. Rajiv is a one, but I love your energy, and I'd like you to observe, Rajiv, what happens to your energy as we do this exercise. So I'm seeing, oh, they're, they're flooding in. And I think from, from the numbers that are flooding in now, I think our average is 8.3 at the moment, which is extremely high. It's about three o'clock in the afternoon for you there at the moment, is it? 
That's right. We yeah. Talked. Well, it's 7.30 in the evening for me. My energy is pretty good. I'm about a nine. But my question for everybody is this. I want to, you to think about whether you found that the process of thinking about and naming your energy number caused the energy number to go up a little bit. So I'd like people just to think about this because this is actually a technique. And when we reflect inward and we think about what's going on for us at the moment, what are we thinking, what are we feeling, and we give it a name, we call, I call this name, name it to tame it if you're feeling a little bit unwell, it actually causes your brain to focus and your functioning le level goes up to a higher level, which is particularly useful if you're under a lot of stress at a present time to sit back, reflect, stop, and ask yourself, what is my energy level at the moment? Or, or what's distracting me or what's on my brain? So that's a little technique that I'm sharing with you. We use it all the time and uh, in our business. And it's very important if you're going into a very important meeting, like um, this is a very important meeting for me in talking to you at the moment. Now, in terms of the content that we're gonna cover around relationships are likely to feel strained at the moment. Both um, Gaurav and Sasha, uh, you were both mentioning about personal relationships and business relationships are both important in life. And the thing I love about franchising is that it's very personal because for the franchisees, they're often investing their life savings in a business opportunity and they can be extremely passionate about it for that reason. But that can also cause relationship tensions because people do get um, very emotional at times if, if they're stressed. We'll talk about the three characteristics of sustainably great franchise networks. I'll share some research on how franchisee attributes and your, how a culture that develops in a franchise organization affects the performance of the franchisees as well as the franchisor and the experience of the customers. And I've been asked to share a little bit about what's been going on strategically in the Australian franchising sector at the moment. It's a very interesting, quite a mature market here. And I think there are some lessons that you may want to take on board in the Indian market. And for those Indian companies that are coming to Australia, I understand there's quite an interest. I think it's important that you are across some of these trends and uh, things that are going on in Australia. And of course, we'll take some questions as well from everybody. So I want everyone just to reflect for a moment and just to imagine that you were sailing this boat across a lovely calm bay. There's a gentle breeze blowing. The hull in the boat, boat has got a little bit of rot and maybe there's some tears in the sails, but they haven't caused any major problems to date. And then along comes COVID-19 and along comes the shutdown and the stress and the uncertainty. And now we're in rough seas and there's strong winds and our boat's getting bashed around and our sails are stretched to the limit and the rot in the hull perhaps might be, you know, giving way and, and water starts to come in and we're, we're pretty soon going to be in trouble. And relationships are like this. So in calm, predictable times, any underlying tensions, are going to remain there, they're not going to cause any major problems, like the rot that's sitting in a boat. But as the stress of change and uncertainty hits and, and stretches our, our coping resources, our existing relationship weaknesses are going to be exposed. Now, some of you may have experienced an increase in relationship tensions in recent times, particularly if there's been some unresolved issues. And I don't know whether the two brothers on the call here have, have had any relationship issues, but you two guys seem to get on extremely well together. But it's normal during periods of intense change, not just at work, but also on the family and the home front, that, uh, you know, like families have been locked in lockdown together. And in, in Australia, and I'm sure in many countries, the governments have said, we don't want you going out. And, and so children are at home and people are trying to run their businesses at home and it can really bring out some ugly aspects of relationships if there have been some underlying tensions there. However, there are things we can do to strengthen our relationships and to repair relationships. 
that may be a little strained. And I want to now give you eight tips. Tips, we'll just jump into these that we've found are useful. So through our research, we have found that even in calm times, when you're in a franchise network together and you're sharing a brand and everyone's reputation is affected by the actions of everybody else, there is often a certain level of tension. And Sashin, we were talking about this earlier, you, you were saying you'd like me to cover the interdependence of a franchise relationship and how we can get this operating at a really nice high level. So here's eight tips to resolve any issues that you may find in your relationships. And this relates to not just work, but it could be at home, it could be with your colleagues, it could be with your staff, or if you're a franchisee with your franchise, or if you're a franchise or with your franchisees. And the first one is to genuinely listen to what the other person is saying with an open mind. And I'm referring here to really listening for understanding, not just the words that people are saying. And it helps if you can paraphrase back to someone what you understand they just said and why it's important to them. This is extremely powerful. And franchise or executives on the call, if there's one thing I want you to take away from this session, is the importance of showing empathy and empathy is demonstrating that you understand someone else's point of view and that you're showing a certain level of respect and compassion from, from their perspective. Now, the second point is to focus on what you have in common. Now, in the case of franchisees and franchisors, there's two things that are connecting you, and that is your brand that you're sharing and your love and commitment to your customers. So this is often a good thing to come back to and say, what is the right thing to do here that's gonna be right for the brand and right for the customers, if there's some disagreements. The third thing is that it's very helpful to show up, express your appreciation, even for small positive gestures that people make. A thank you or, or an expression of appreciation costs nothing, but it actually stimulates good feelings in other people. And those feelings are very powerful. So don't underestimate the, the importance of being grateful. The next point is about forgiveness. And it's, it's one of those words, it's easy to say, oh yes, forgive and forget. But I often see situations where people feel resentful, uh, they feel their franchisor or their franchisees have done the wrong thing and they hang on to that and it uses up a tremendous amount of emotional energy and it leads to distraction and it actually can lead to a corruption in the culture. So, you know, and, and it physically can create ill health if people are holding on to resentments and anger. So genuinely letting things go is extremely important. The fifth point is about, nip, we call it nipping things in the bud. So what that is, is if something is niggling you or bothering you, don't let it build up. Conflict, never just appears out of nowhere. It's often a build up over time until someone says something and then the other person explodes because there's been this build up of, of um, frustration. So it's good to just be able to express yourself, take responsibility for your emotions and say, look, I am feeling a little bit frustrated by this and here's why. And I've even got a suggestion of what might help here. And the next point is about valuing differences. So my wife, I love my wife dearly. She's extremely the opposite to me in personality. And why would I want to marry someone who is exactly the same as me? Because it's the differences that make up the whole in life. And if we look at high performing teams, they've always got a diversity of personalities and a diversity of experience. But sometimes we get frustrated by the differences because people don't think the same way as we do. So I think there's a lot of value in reminding ourselves that we, we can understand the point of view of the other person and that creates the whole. Now, here's the rub in franchising. Franchisors are often tied up strategically, they're planning, they're in their head offices. It's very easy to lose connection with the, the real world of what's going on in customer land, whereas the franchisees are experiencing customers and what customers are looking for day in, day out. So smart franchisors listen very carefully to the franchisee's perspective on things. Number seven is my favorite. And that is about having a growth mindset. So 
So what is a growth mindset? I would define it simply as that I am focused on improving myself rather than proving myself. So when we're trying to prove ourselves, we justify. And uh, when we try and justify and prove that we're right, what does that do to the other person? It makes them wrong, right? And, it, and nobody feels good about being wrong. So it takes a lot of courage and humility to hold strong opinions loosely. And I find it, it's very useful if you can have a curious mindset and really try and understand almost like a journalist, try and understand the other person's point of view. Sometimes it lowers your defensiveness and it builds a much more uh, strong, not only do you learn something about how the other person's feeling, but it, it also builds that respect. And I'm gonna come back to the importance of respect in a few minutes. And finally, don't feel too proud. If you've got a tension in the franchise relationship to seek help from a trusted advisor, a colleague, or a professional if you need it. Um, I have often brought in a facilitator in my own business from time to time to help us resolve any sticky issues. So I'm just gonna pause for a moment because we've been talking about the importance of relationships and I've got a question for everybody on the call. I think you'll enjoy reflecting on this and then I want you to type in your thoughts into the chat box. And the question is this, what is something that you've done recently to help maintain a healthy relationship at work or home? It can be the smallest thing, but I'd like everyone to just type in something into the feed, something that you've done recently that you think has helped to strengthen or repair a relationship with anyone. So let's see who's going to jump in first. Thank you, Prem. So Prem is, I love that Prem. Prem is so listening and just sometimes we need to zip up our mouth whoop, and listen. And we've got um, some, Cheyenne is saying he feeds around 20,000 people. So he must have a, a big uh, network of, of uh, stores. Again, we've got giving and taking, valuing other people, showing that you truly care, giving other people space. Um, we've got um, someone is saying, uh, giving job opportunities. Um, that's terrific, Prashi, um, to, to 100 people. Um, sharing the burden with my wife. I'm sure your wife would appreciate that. Hurring ha, yes. Um, Prachi saying he donates to an orphanage. That's terrific. Um, we've got Prince saying that he gives his services for free um, and that builds trust. Um, so there's a ter terrific list there. And, and my guess is as you're typing these, you're feeling pretty good because it reminds you it doesn't take a lot of effort to, to um, strengthen a relationship. And it's those little things that can often make the difference. Um, Prashi saying that um, she's doing counselling for domestic violence victims. Wonderful. So, uh, Gaurav, I'm going to move on now and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Franchise Relationships Institute and why we do what we do. And then I'm going to share some research with the group. Is that good? Absolutely good. And uh, going well? good remark. Okay. He sent ice cream to his, all his franchisees. <laughs> I love that. Terrific. Yeah. And I love the last one there, Rajiv is just saying listening in again. Uh, I think that's terrific. And Janak saying they loved it. <laughs> All right, so let's just talk about Franchise Relationships Institute for a moment. Look, before I founded this organization 32 years ago, I, I was a psychologist and um, I was doing research on the brain at Monash University in Melbourne. And a friend, but, but while I was studying to be a psychologist, I had worked in company owned stores for a bakery group. And um, I became pretty good at, at, at the baking work and serving customers and making bread and so on. And a multi-unit franchisee called me and he asked me, Greg, would you like to come into business with me? I'm about to open my third store and you, can, you could be my operations manager and my part, business partner. And I thought that would be a great idea. So um, I took out a loan and uh, I became a multi-unit franchisee. And um, I was particularly interested during my time as a franchisee about my relationship with the franchisor. And then 
I was asked to join the franchisor. So I experienced life as a franchisor executive heading up the marketing department and the operations department. But what I, in reflection, what I was finding is that when I was a franchisee, I often seemed to be at loggerheads with the franchisor team and arguing with them and say, telling them to stop bossing me around because I owned the business. But when I joined the franchisor team, I seemed to often be at loggerheads with my franchisees because I was wanting them to do things and they were telling me to stop bossing them around because they were their own independent business owners. Now, and I did seek out some help to try and understand the nature of the relationship because it's very interesting. And because not an employee employer relationship and it's not a business partnership strictly, but I couldn't find any books. I couldn't find any training programs to be how to be a successful franchisee or how to be a successful franchisor. So I founded the Franchise Relationships Institute to find answers to these franchise relationship challenges that I was seeing everywhere. All my colleagues in other franchise groups were, were experiencing the same thing. And I wanted to share our research and our insights with the rest of the world, like, like we're doing right now. So as specialists in the psychology of the franchise relationships, we're passionate about our mission, which is to foster the creation of profitable partnerships in the global franchising sector. And over the past 32 years, we've conducted research and education programs with over 500 different brands across 16 countries. And we're continually identifying what does best practice look like and creating tools and models and books and education programs. And we're extremely passionate about we, what we do. And, and this is, I want people to pay particular attention to what I'm about to say, because I don't want you to make the same mistake that I see so many people making when they get into the franchising business. Now, I thought that because I knew everything about baking and selling bread, right, that I could effectively lead and motivate my franchisees. Now, the reality is that all franchisees and franchisors on the planet are in two businesses. You're in the business of selling your product or service, your ice cream, your pizzas, whatever it might be, whatever service you're delivering, and you've got to be excellent at that. But you are also in the business of franchising. And to be in the business of franchising, whether you're a franchise or all franchisee, you need to understand the nature of the relationship and how to effectively collaborate. And Gurev, I'm sure you've seen this, where people are amazing at their product or service, but they don't know how to lead effectively and how to influence and collaborate. I can see you nodding there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So over the past 32 years, we've worked with hundreds of brands like these and, and lots of others. And we've learned that all franchisors have similar challenges. All franchisees have similar challenges in this challenge of collaboration, but the best franchisors in particular, I want to just talk from the franchisors perspective for a moment, draw on the same best practices. So whether you're in dog washing or cleaning or making bread or selling clothes, there are similar practices in franchising that translate across industries. Now, what I found that there's only about 20% of the hundreds of franchise networks that we've worked with that I would classify as being sustainably great in terms of how they operate their businesses. And the reason these people are in the top 20% is they consistently do certain things. Now, we would um, put these people in the top 20% because they're growing consistently, their franchisees are profitable, the franchisor is profitable, they've got low levels of disputation, and their market share is also growing. So let's look at the three characteristics of these sustainably great networks. And the first one is that they, they do understand that they're in the business of franchising. Now, it starts with ongoing well-managed innovation and understanding that a franchisor's capacity to innovate is always going to outstrip the franchisee's ability to accommodate. So in other words, the franchisor is often going to be pushing franchisees to do things and the franchisees are going to be resisting, all right? 
Now, this is particularly important at the moment also because all franchise networks have had to innovate very quickly to adapt to the pandemic and the challenges that this is, is thrown to all of us. Now, to innovate well, you're always going to go through the sigmoid curve. So you can see the curve. You've all seen this curve before. I call it the curve of life. It applies to every living thing on the planet. People, plants, animals, careers, products, services, and of course, businesses. Now, the sigmoid curve predicts that when something new is initiated in a business, like you're, you're launching a new product, or I've got one client who in 10 days, they transitioned 10,000 franchisees from operating um, live um, in terms of their links with their customers to delivering their products and services remotely. It was amazing, but that's an example of quick and rapid change. Now, you're always going to experience an initial dip in performance when you introduce something new, like um, the changes that we're experiencing, like working from home. Most people, when they were forced to start working from home, were struggling with um, how to use Zoom or whatever platform they're using, how to connect to the office, how to communicate with their, with their teams and so on. But over time, we start to get better and, and we start to, our performance goes up. Now, we can do our best to accommodate um, and grow, and often we will, but nothing is forever. And so even when things start to go well, if we don't innovate again, we're going to see a maturation and a drop in performance. So it's important that franchisors are innovating constantly. And we find the best franchisors innovate, they, they, they get the new innovation through, and then they'll start innovating again and again and again. Now, this curve also applies to every franchisee who's listening on the call today as well. Your individual business will also go through this curve. And in five years, even when your business is going really well, you are going to need to reinvent yourself. You may bring in a, a partner, you may uh, renovate your premises, you may move to a new location, you may become a multi-unit franchisee to keep yourself motivated and growing. All right, so this um, is absolutely critical. And the next thing that I want to talk about when we talk about excellent franchisors is clarity of purpose. So you're in the franchising business, yes, but it's absolutely essential that you are clearer about your values as an organization. What do you stand for? And why do you exist? Now, our best clients are constantly talking about the difference they make to the local community, the difference they make to employing people, the difference that they make to the health of the economy and so on. And I think you can't talk about this stuff enough. This is what creates a healthy culture. And the other thing they do is they put all major decisions through a filter. So like it's a, like a coffee filter I've got here. And the question is, is this going to be right, not just for our brand and for our culture, but for the various stakeholder groups, all right? Now, one question I want everybody on the call to think about for a moment is, who are the most important stakeholders in your franchise network? And I'd like everybody, please, to pick, like if I was to ask you to prioritize when we look at customers, shareholders, franchisees, members of the franchise or team, um, staff who, who work for the franchise company, um, who's the most important? And I'd like you to pop in. Now, I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer here because people have different perspectives, but I'm just interested in your perspective. So some people are saying the staff who deliver, some people are saying the customers, some people are saying the franchisees, some people are saying customers and franchisees. That's, Sunil, you're cheating there because I only want you to give me one. <laughs> Sachin, you, you and Gaurav, Gaurav might like to put in. So most people are saying the customers. Now, and Janik's saying it's absolutely the staff. <laughs> Now, this is very interesting. 
Now, Richard Branson would say it's the staff. If you have happy staff, they will deliver um, excellent service to the customers. And Shamil says, Gandhi says, customers are God. <laughs> I love that. Now, I want to introduce you to somebody. So this is Cheryl Bashelda. Now, I, I interviewed Cheryl Bashelda a few years ago when she was the CEO of Popeye's Chicken, very successful franchise network in North America, 2,600 stores. So this is a, a group you'd want to pay attention to. And she'd previously led Popeye's through five years of consistent sales and profit growth. They had a 400% increase in their share price from when she came in as CEO to, to uh, five years later. And they had a queue of franchisees wanting more stores. And she told me that the first question that she tackled with her executive team when she became the CEO was this question. Who is our most important stakeholder? Which is the question we're all wrestling with now. She took them all away on a retreat and they locked themselves up for days. And after discussion and debate, you know, the marketing person said it's the customers and the finance person saying it's the shareholders and the operations managers saying it's the franchisees and the HR managers saying, no, no, it's the staff, right? So they're debating and everyone's got a point of view, but they did come to a conclusion and they decided the franchisee is the most important stakeholder. And they figured that if the franchisee is doing a great job in running their business and, and motivating their staff and leading their staff, the customers are gonna receive great service, sales are gonna go up, the company shareholders are gonna get a great return on their investment, investment and everyone's gonna be happy. And she said from that point, when they decided the franchisee was the key stakeholder, everything changed. And they put every decision through this filter. How is this going to impact on our franchisees? They ran regular satisfaction surveys for the franchisees. They set up franchise advisory committees to listen to the franchisees. Whenever, even when they, they rolled out a new store design at the convention, and they'd spent you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars developing and setting up these prototypes of store designs. The franchisees came to the convention and they asked, what do you think? And they said, we don't like it. <laughs> it's too expensive. And they were pointing out all the flaws. Now the store design team got very defensive and they're saying, well, you know, we, we've, we've researched this. And Cheryl said, no, we're going back to the drawing board. And for the next 18 months, they had to redesign <laughs> the whole thing. And she said, but that delay was a win in the, in the old day. It's, you know, lose the battle, win the war. Because when they did roll out the store design that the franchisees had had input to, into, 90% of franchisees signed up for it immediately and sales started to grow as a result of this because everybody was on board. So you understand what I'm saying here. We need to get the franchisees on board, we need to treat them seriously as a strategic partner. Now, I've always argued this, that if the franchisees are doing a great job, everything else is gonna fall into place. Now, let's look at the third characteristic now of best practice franchise networks. And that's where we come into this issue of collaboration. Now, collaboration means working together to maintain a competitive edge. And that means that the, the franchisees are focusing on the things that they need to focus on. The franchisors focusing on the things they need to focus on. There is a middle overlapping area, which is the collaboration area. But collaboration also means we're not doubling up. And this is how we create a nice, healthy, high performance culture. Now, there's a word, accountability, which is different to responsibility. So, we can all be responsible for working together as a team and creating the culture, but accountability, you can't share. The buck has to stop with somebody. So the franchisee is accountable for three things. Let's look at them. The first is to turn every customer into an advocate for the business and for the brand. 
by delivering exceptional customer service and an exceptional experience. Franchisor can't do that. Franchisee is leading the team at the, at the pointy end of the business. The second thing is the franchisee must focus on maximizing their profit by growing revenue and controlling costs. And the third thing is they must participate constructively in the franchise network by engaging in activities and supporting important brand initiatives. If you aren't prepared to get behind the initiatives and do the right thing by the brand, you should not become a franchisee. Now the franchisor also has three accountabilities. And the first one is leadership. To lead with credibility. Now that means that you make good research-based or evidence-based decisions. You are trustworthy and transparent with the information and you are caring about the personal and business success of your franchisees. The second thing is you need to provide relevant support that matches the evolving need of each franchisee. And the third thing is you need to protect the brand and not allow anyone to do anything that could embarrass or damage the reputation of everyone else. All right? Now I'm gonna show you something very interesting. This is in one of the books I wrote called Profitable Partnerships. And it's a case study. Now these are sales figures of four stores that when I was operating a region in the Brumbies network, and I was very interested that the sales changed significantly at a certain point in all these particular stores. And this sale increased suddenly, it was not driven by marketing, it was not driven by product innovation, it was not driven by any change to the store location or design. What changed at these points is the franchisee who was running the stores. So in that top one, the blue one there, a company manager for the store became a franchisee and suddenly the sales started to increase. So never underestimate the significant role a franchisee plays in driving the performance of a business. And for all the franchisors on the call, your royalty revenue will come from the performance of the franchisees. So you have a vested interest in making sure your franchisees are performing at a high level. I have a question for everybody on the call. And if you like, you can put your response in the chat box. I'm interested in what percentage of a store's performance do you think is driven by the franchisee, the person, as opposed to the brand, the location, the processes, all the support that they're receiving. So you might like to, so I've got some percentages coming in. Some people are saying 60%, 70%. When I asked this question to a group of 60 franchise or CEOs once, there was a guy sitting there and he said, 100% franchisee. And I said, oh, that means that your brand is worthless and your systems are worthless. And he said, 50-50, <laughs> he changed his mind. But look, I can tell you from our research, so we've got some interesting <laughs> figures coming in there. It is about 40%. Now don't underestimate 40%, this is on average, because the brand is, should be very powerful. The location of the business, your business systems can make a huge difference to the performance of the business but 40% is huge. And I, I wanna now talk about how the attributes of a franchisee interact with the attributes of the franchise or team to drive performance. And you'll find, Gaurav, you'll find this particularly interesting because I know that you're a, you're a very thinking sort of a guy and, and interested in the latest research. Now, we did a study looking at the relationship between people and performance, because as a psychologist, this absolutely fascinates me and um, I love researching this stuff. And we've done a lot of research in this. And this is a study, it's been published in a very prestigious journal called the Journal of Business and Psychology. Now two attributes in particular that we know drive sales and profitability are what's called proactivity and brand passion. Now proactivity is where a person makes things happen, they take accountability. They say, if it is to be, it is up to me. That's a proactive person's philosophy. Brand passion is 
I love my brand and I am going to talk about the difference we make and how fantastic our products and services are to anyone who will listen to me. If you've got a franchisee with that attitude, they create a very vibrant culture around them which drives performance. So we can prove through research that brand passion and proactivity drive profitability and drive a great customer experience. But what about the franchise or the team? What influence might they have on a franchisee's performance? So we looked at this, we asked nearly 1,800 franchisees from 74 franchise networks how the level of love and support they were feeling from their franchise or team. So in other words, do they feel there's a supportive franchising culture? And there's a couple of questions there we asked the franchisees to respond to in the survey. Do you feel that you're treated with respect? And do you feel the franchise or team genuinely cares about your success? And what we discovered is when the franchisee disagrees with these statements and they don't feel the love and respect, their proactivity drops, their brand passion drops, and that has a dampening effect on their performance. All right? However, the good news is when the franchisees agree with the statement and they, they feel that they are part of a supportive culture and that the franchisor does care about them and so on, their proactivity goes up. They get more motivated, they get more energy um, and that drives the customer experience and that drives performance. And we get this beautiful virtuous cycle, royalties go up, the franchisor has better revenue and everybody's happy. happy. So you understand that this care, this culture of caring is so important to the financial performance and to the experience that customers are going to ultimately have. Now, I'm going to say a few more things and then we're going to open it up to, to Q&A. But uh, earlier I introduced you to a concept called the sigmoid curve and we discussed this in terms of the franchise or network, but I want to look at this from the impact of a franchisee for the moment. Now, every franchisee goes through this journey. There are stages. So the first stage is we call this um, investigation. Should I or do I want to join this franchise network? Is this something that matches with my aspirations and my values? Once the franchisee signs the franchise agreement, they then move into initiation. Now, initiation is where they're going to be trained by the franchise department and uh, they're going to learn all about how to run the business and so on. And then the rubber hits the road and they open their business and we call this the perspiration stage. Now, my point is this. I said earlier that the, the level of service and the nature of the support that you provide to your franchisees has to change as the franchisee goes through this journey. So franchisees in the perspiration stage are very stressed out. They need a lot of hand holding, a lot of reassurance, and a lot of practical support. But gradually, their confidence grows, their sales grow, they reach break even, they start to make money. And this is beautiful. We call this the consolidation stage. I, I am now all across my business, and I've now got staff who know what they're doing. I've got regular customers coming back, I've got reg regular cash flow and I'm in a really nice place. However, as we learned before, nothing is forever. And if we do not reinvent ourselves as franchisees, our sales are gonna to start to decline. So we call this the maturation stage, and it's up to the franchise or sometimes to give us a little push or a poke to remind us that we need to perhaps reinvent ourselves and reinvest in our business, and we call this the reformation stage. So six stages, six different types of support franchisees need. And everybody in the world at the moment is going through the reformation stage because all our businesses have been turned upside down. Now, Gurav, you asked me to talk a little bit about Australia and what's been going on in Australia. And um, I'm, I've got a photo of someone. When I put this up uh, a few weeks ago, someone, and I said, who is this? They said, oh, is that JK Rowling? you know, who wrote the Harry Potter books? No, this lady is a, an investigative journalist called Adele Ferguson. And Adele Ferguson has written a series of articles. She's a very good journalist, a very thorough, 
on uh, the franchising sector, all right? And um, now we're all moving through volatile and uncertain times at the moment, but the franchising sector is also been moving through volatile, volatile times, particularly in Australia. Now, in 2015, Adele Ferguson targeted the 7-Eleven brand, all right, in Australia, because that there was systemic underpayment of staff by franchisees within the system. And as a result of a series of articles and television um, documentaries that appeared on a current affair and so on, it led to a change in the laws in Australia. And it all happened very quickly to make franchisors legally responsible for the conduct of their franchisees, particularly where the franchisees are paying and managing their staff correctly. Now, this sent a massive shockwave through the franchising sector, not only in Australia, but globally, particularly in, in America. Because in America, there's been a debate raging now for over six years on whether franchisors should be held accountable if franchisees are not doing the right thing by their franchise, uh, if the franchisees aren't doing the right thing by the staff. That's, uh, this is a, a legal debate going on with the National Labor Relations Board, and it's called joint employer liability. But this is actually coming to Australia as a law now. So um, that's been one thing that, that has occurred because some franchisees were doing the wrong thing. And we don't, you don't want this because it puts enormous um, compliance costs on everybody. And now the franchisors are spending time and money checking up on payroll of franchisees when they should be focusing on other things. Now, Adele Ferguson then went after a company called RFG. And RFG were a multi-brand franchisor. They've got seven or eight different brands and she exposed poor conduct by the franchisor at the time in how franchisees were being supported and treated. And, um, but then she started writing articles about the whole franchising sector, accusing the whole sector of being greedy and taking advantage of franchisees. And so this led to a number of bad um, newspaper articles and the franchising brand suffered. And as, as a result of that, the federal government in Australia uh, did an inquiry and they had a parliamentary inquiry. And last year, the parliamentary inquiries re report was handed down. And this is significant. The report was called Fairness in Franchising. And it focuses particularly on franchisors being transparent in how they deal with their franchisees and being fair and respectful in how they deal with the franchisees. Now, we've been arguing for 30 years that this is, is absolutely vital, that franchisors are fair and respectful and transparent in terms of how they lead. But now in Australia, this is becoming a legal responsibility of franchisors to do this. And it's a pity, because I think this is just a basic thing that everybody should be doing. Now, um, because of COVID, the, the, the implications of this report haven't yet been set in stone in terms of changes to the law. But my prediction is in the, in the next six months, the government are gonna come out with some changes to franchising laws in Australia that are gonna force franchisors to be more transparent about how they're running their businesses, how they're pricing, if they're supplying products and services to franchisees, the level of any rebates that are being passed back to franchisors, how they're spending their marketing funds and so on. Now to complete, before I, we open it up to questions, we've just completed a major study on franchisee satisfaction with over 7,000 franchisees, looking at what drives franchisees to have what we call an ACE mindset. Now an ACE mindset is where franchisees are advocates for the franchise network, so in other words, if someone asked one of your existing franchisees, what's it like and would you recommend this business? The existing franchisee says, I love this business and you're crazy if you don't you know, buy one of these businesses. That's an advocate. The second thing is whether the franchisees want to reinvest and expand into multiple units and, and invest in their own unit. 
and the third one is being fully engaged in supporting the initiatives um, that's that constructive participation I talked about earlier. Now, the biggest predictor of whether or not franchisees are going to have an ACE mindset is whether or not their expectations are being met. Now, I'm not just talking about how much money they're going to be making, but also how they feel they're being treated. Do they feel they're being treated respectfully? Do they feel that the franchisor is being fair with them in terms of not doing special deals for some franchisees, but not with them. So I would argue that expectations and the management of expectations, particularly in the early stages of the relationship, is probably one of the most important things that a franchisor and a franchisee need to align on. Now I'm gonna pause at that point and I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll just pass back to you, Gaurav and Sushin. Thank you very much. It was uh, really full of learning and I think it was very, very helpful for all the audience there. Sachin, over to you. You have a lot of questions for Greg and let's get going on. You're on mute. Uh, thank you, Greg. That was wonderful. Uh, you know, uh, franchise relationship surely is the, uh, is the key to any system success. Uh, my first question is that how do you prioritize, uh, you know, the, uh, you usually speak about this personal journey and business journey. So, so how do you differentiate and how do you prioritize it? Great question. Now, the two journeys, often there's a paradox here and they often cause confusion. So I said earlier that when a franchisee starts the business, and they're struggling, and then the, the business starts to grow and develop sales start going up and it start, they start to make money, all right? And you would think that at this point, people get happy, right? Because my business is succeeding. And you know what happens? The opposite. So as the franchisee gets more experience and starts to understand how much profit they're making, their satisfaction starts to drop. Would you believe that? So we have another we have another curve. One curve, the, the satisfaction starts high and it goes down. And, and we, we have names for these stages. So we say the franchise is in glee initially. And then they start to look at how many fees they're, they're paying to the franchise. So they go in the fee stage and their satisfaction drops. And then they look at how hard they're working and they say, I'm putting in so much hard work and the business is all about me. And what are you doing for me? And so we call that the me stage. And then they want to break, they want to push the franchisor back and say, stop telling me what to do. And I went through all this as a franchisee, right? And I call that the free stage. And at that point, conflict is most likely to occur. However, sales may be going up while satisfaction is dropping. And this is where sitting down together and having these conversations, and this is why I opened the session today with those eight tips on how to resolve conflict. This is so important for franchisee and franchisor. So the two journeys, sales are going up, profit going up, satisfaction is going down, but then satisfaction will come back up and then we'll get aligned again, normally about two to four years in. And also just to add, I mean, there's a very interesting story I'd like to share. There's a company which we, we advised from the start and it was just a startup. And, uh, and they went to about 200 franchises and the founder invited me to speak to all their franchises. And I was sitting in the group and waiting for him to first speak and then I was supposed to speak. And he went up and he said, look, we have done this and we have done that and, and we are now successful 200 franchises and we are now bringing a new logo for a brand and we want you to change the boards and new signages you want to do, right? And somebody sitting behind me said, why didn't he pay for us to change the board? Why should we put money to the board? And I was then called to speak. And I said, look, what is this? What is all happened when he was, he was just a startup. He had nothing. You bought into his idea. You went and put thousands and thousands of dollars into the business. You trusted him. You trusted the business. Now the business is built very big, you know, and everybody is making money, but now you don't want to put a thousand dollar more and you want him to pay for this just because what has happened is that there is no excitement left and this all has gone this whole structure is fatigued 
and that fatigue uh, actually causes a lot of problems and you rightly said unless and until you are able to discover that it gets into very me time and gets even more difficult and most of the time ego. people uh, start clashing egos too uh, well you need to do this for me and you know i know better than you yeah most of the competition for great franchises has actually come from the most successful franchises of theirs who actually went down and opened up their own brand just because they were very successful and they were not recognized and because they were not recognized they became the biggest competition for the franchise at themselves you know so so that happens you know this is very important to assess that if somebody is really become well at both sides they bring in active dialogue and start doing it what we call in india we are doing a lot of programs in uh, what we call err how do you encourage recognize and reward uh, continuously your franchises and their belongingness would increase and your belongingness increase then obviously they would stay uh, committed to the network and appreciate the changes excellent and if i could just add something to this guru just from a psychologist perspective that the brain at your brain and my brain and sashin's brain and everybody's brain on the call today is the product of evolution of millions of years all right so all our brains have evolved in a similar way and the the brain is very sensitive to status all right now there's a reason for this because the higher your status if you were a wolf or an ant or a bee or a dolphin or a monkey or a human being the higher you are in the hierarchy the better life you have it's just a fact right and we subconsciously know this we're born with this knowledge so when people are respected and given that that sense of respect and reward it it it's very the brain loves it and it releases positive chemicals in the brain and people feel good if you pe- treat someone with disrespect and don't give them that sense of importance they get very angry and they can feel very distressed and that can drive people to make decisions that are commercially even not sensible but they're so sort of um they feel so strongly about this they'll go and they'll say no i'm going to do this to prove to other people that i can do this because i i don't feel that i've been respected i've lost face so that's the first thing so this is from a psychology point of view from a genetic point of view we must recognize and give people respect now the the other part of this is fairness and gurav that case study you gave where people where the franchise or says to the franchisees i want you to spend money the question in the franchisee's mind is is this fair all right and fairness is also programmed into us even my dog if i don't take my dog for his walk at 5:30 every day he gets very angry because he feels that's unfair because he's he he's expecting that all right so fairness is in the eye of the beholder largely however you ne- you need to be able to explain to your franchisees why that decision is fair all right so the reason why i'm asking you to spend $1000 is we've spent $100,000 on the research to come up with the signage now we're going to share the cost of implementation with you and you are going to get a return on your investment for spending that that's why we feel it's fair it's not because we're telling you to do this yeah, absolutely yeah? so so thank that's a brilliant case study thank you what else have we got yeah so my, my next question gar uh, is to gar uh, you know we speak about uh, relationships and we also run remax which is one of the largest uh, franchise chain so so one of the things that we normally speaks about is brand passion so would you want to sort of make this brand passion with a great large one one 125000 franchisees of remax and how this is kind of translates how this passion translates into this very large franchise network <laughs> he wants to know how to translate passion yeah into large groups in the large okay group. so it's very simple that we have a virus going around at the moment all right it's amazingly contagious we should learn from the virus because brand passion is contagious and if you are passionate as a leader 
that will infect everybody you, you touch. <laughs> and the higher, we talked about hierarchy, the higher you go up in the hierarchy, the more power you have to infect other people. This is how culture is created. So if you are in a leadership role, you have to look in the mirror every morning and say, how do I honestly feel about going to work today? How do I honestly feel about my business? And if you've lost your sense of purpose, you need to dig deep and find it. Now, a few weeks ago, I was, it was raining and it was cold. It's winter in Melbourne at the moment. And I was tired. I'd worked very hard. And the following morning, I was to deliver a virtual forum. We run, we run these virtual forums for field managers. All right. And so I had 50 field managers who I was going to be talking to for 90 minutes. And it was nine o'clock at night and I had to go home and prepare for this talk. And I started to think, oh, poor me. Why, uh, I'm gonna have a late night and I'm tired. And I suddenly stopped myself and I said, Greg, what are you doing? You started this business to help field managers and to make a difference. And tomorrow morning, you have the opportunity to touch the lives of 50 field managers and help them. And when I reconnected with my sense of purpose, I got this surge of energy suddenly, my passion came back and I got home, I prepared my talk and the following morning I had a ball, you know, delivering this session. So we need to make sure we stay connected. This was the second point that I made about high performing franchisors, sense of purpose. What, why do we do what we do? And constantly reminding yourself and your team, that would be my answer. And for a real estate agent to give people the opportunity to own their own home, their dream home, changes people's lives. And uh, that's what they're in the business of doing, giving people a better life. Absolutely. And just to add on that, I think all great organizations uh, have two very strong things which I have seen. And Remax is one, and, and there are all other networks also. There's a network which is all over the world called BNI. And there is a there is a sense of what we call power of giving, you know. So unless or until we we build this as a culture within and then create a nucleus within the franchise organizations, and they should be given only one culture and say power of giving. If you are able to continue to support and give and an honest uh, uh, support to your franchisees, uh, you will sign sooner or later. This would start reflecting on them, and they were they would start recognizing the importance of the that you were around at that time and helping them. And so, Experience. If these two things are very clearly defined and we become champions on that and there's no conflict between them, then the relationship lasts much better. Absolutely. BNI um, are a client of ours. They're a global network. They're in 70 countries. They've got thousands of franchisees. And they have a mantra, givers gain. And I love this. So it's the idea that when you give, it will come back to you and it's, it's very much embedded in their culture. And I think this is what you're saying, that when we have this attitude of giving and being helpful, it's, very, it's actually physically very good for the brain as well. There's chemicals released when you are helpful. It's called the helper's high. So we don't need marijuana and other things. We get high on just being helpful and giving. And uh, this is a very healthy attitude and philosophy to have in business and life. Absolutely. Have we got time for any more questions? We'll, we'll take uh, uh, one last one. I, I've been wanting to ask this, and this is uh, exciting. So one is, uh, you know, about royalty and royalty. You know, so you, you <laughs> usually say that the relationship of franchisor and franchisee is around royalty, which they get, but soon it kind of uh, grows into uh, franchisee become the most important part of the network. So, so. How does, and particularly from Australia, you have a lot of international franchises. So, you know, how, how is it spanning out there? Yes. So, look, it's very important that 
people get value for money. And this comes back to fairness from their royalties. And the litmus test, there's a couple of litmus tests here. So the first thing is, could the franchisee make more money and be more successful if they weren't paying royalties and were out inventing their own system and trading under their own brand name, right? And if that's the case, there's something wrong because the competitive edge that comes from being part of a franchise network means that you should be able to charge higher, higher uh, prices for your product because the value of the brand, people say, oh, this is wonderful. This jacket that I'm wearing, actually, I bought it in Delhi. When I was, I came over to talk at your con conference and I went to a shop and I could have bought the jacket cheaper at another st store, but I loved the brand. This particular brand was a chain and I was happy to pay more money for this, right? And happy to because of the value of the brand. And I, I felt a sense of trust in the quality, right? But also there should be productivity improvements and, and uh, buying benefits that enable you to get your cost of goods down that also allow you to make more money. This is why people join a franchise network. So that's the, the first thing, that uh, are you able to make more money? money? The second thing is the franchisor should not be making more money from royalty than the franchisee is making from profit, all right? So if the landlord is making more percentage on revenue than the franchisee is making, there's something wrong. And if the franchisor is making more money from royalty than the franchisee is making from profit, there's something wrong with the model. So that, that would be a, a few thoughts. And I'll leave you with this saying, and it comes from a franchisee who filled out one of our franchisee satisfaction surveys. He said, quote, when I started in this business, I was treated like royalty. And now my franchisor treats me like royalties. <laughs> and that sums it up. And he wasn't very happy. <laughs> That's right. So there are uh, uh, remarks from you. No, it's a very valuable and I think uh, it was a learning always meeting you is refreshing our, our thoughts and what their contribution to the industry and franchising. We are also looking forward and working closely with uh, Greg's team and uh, trying to see that if we can have a full session and invite him for for having especially CXOs uh, and there are a lot of companies in India we have about uh, 4,500 franchise systems active in India and I think a lot of top CXOs also need a, a bit of a learning understand how how franchising has evolved over the times and how they can better their management uh, systems. And so we would love to do that and uh, get the, the CEOs and the executives together from the franchise or team and share our research and knowledge. And my CEO, Anthony Cannell's on the call and Anthony will be nodding his head <laughs> vigorously because he's passionate also about our products and service. <laughs> You're on mute there, Anthony. I don't know whether you wanted to say something. Hello, everybody. I've been listening to you, Greg, and you've been, been in fine form tonight. And I think uh, we would love to run some sessions and, 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 and spread the word of positiveness around the franchise industry, the franchise sector in, uh, in India. I think there's a lot of learnings that they can, they can come to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, everybody who's, who's been uh, staying here. Uh, have a, have a, have a you. Namaste from India. Namaste. <laughs> That's good.